Don't go that far back. Camera, camera, <laughs> camera's rolling. Okay, I'm Victoria Bowson, and I am PI of the Liberating Histories Project, and I'm joined by Mel Waters and Eleanor Careless, and women activists from Nottingham who, who are going to talk to us about their experience of reading women's movement magazines. So can we start with just a brief introduction? My name's Barbara Hewitt. I'm Tina. I'm Lee. And I'm Val. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so first of all, maybe just a sense of what magazines you've been reading or you were reading. From when I was a teenager, I'm not going to go back to <laughs> Play Hour and Beano and Dandy. Okay. I've always read a lot of newspapers and magazines. Yeah. Um, so when I was a teenager, I wanted to read Honey, but it was too expensive, I think. And my posh friend had it, but we didn't. I think Jackie yeah, mm -hmm. was accessible. And then, like, you know, 60s hippie stuff, International Times mm -hmm. was a thing. Um, and then, you know, I made my parents get The Guardian from whatever they used to get, Daily Express, but while I was at home, I think I made them get The Guardian. My brother used to read New Statesman, so I used to flick through that. Then at university, I think I got involved with the left, Kind of so then it was the left press like Black Dwarf international you know international mm -hmm. Models group sort of magazines um, Red Mole Socialist Challenge then we had a magazine called Socialist Woman uh, Spare Rib was like widely available and then I started getting because I became a sort of frantic activist for a few years kind of left stuff and women's magazines were mainly so that I could get the information about the stuff that we were organising into them. So that's why like something like Women's Report, where they put events in and, you know, send writing letters to all the other magazines to get events or campaigns in or reading reports of events and campaigns. And now, like I still read The Guardian <laughs> and New Scientist and um, other, you know, I still like magazines, but I don't read any ones that are called women's magazines anymore. I don't even know what they are or where they are. No, I can't think of any. Any other magazines that you were reading? Does anyone remember the, their first encounter with a women's movement magazine? I can say that my first encounter was with Spare Rib. Mm -hmm. And it's a Newcastle story because I come from the northeast, come from uh, the North Pennines. And Newcastle, the Kazani city, and that was many miles away, but we used to go on the bus. And I came across Spare Rib in uh, WH Smith's. We used to only go there three times a year. <laughs> but I must have been attracted to it in mm -hmm. some way. There was something about it. Uh, and then I would say I tried to get it in as often as I could. Uh, so that was my encounter, really. So I would have been probably about 14 at the time, 14, 15, yes, just getting interested in ideas and things, but living in a very isolated little village. So the impact is quite interesting, isn't it, that you can see something, you know, you're changing at school, adolescence, you know there's something going on out there, but you're not quite sure what it is, but you're attracted by something. There's been something in the spare rib at the time. You know, we're talking about the 70s. There must have been something there. I'm trying to remember when Private Eye was available in Smith's, because that was another one that was, you looked to one. see if yeah. it was there. Yeah. Because yeah. many of, there, there was a sort of an argument about whether Smith's would actually hold these magazines, yeah. Private Eye spare rib, wasn't there? Yeah. Some did and some didn't. I think Smith Theatre had most of them today, didn't it? Kept one for most of them. Yeah, yeah. I think that was widely yeah, available. It was quite yeah. mainstream. Yeah. I think the same for me. I was very influenced by Jackie mm -hmm. and then Cosmo, Cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in terms of specifically feminist uh, magazines, it would be when I was at university and I left left home and I came across stuff, and it would be through being involved in campaigns. So my first campaign at the university was to do with nurseries, a nursery campaign, and, and then make, meeting other women and from those other women being given magazines. So this friend, Anne Crowder, gave me Women's Voice. Um, so it was, it was really through other people rather than 
and perhaps being at an event and mm. people selling mm. stuff. But, but in terms of that was more sort of like the male mm. socialist papers rather than the sort of women's only stuff it was really through friends, I think, and then through the contact with the Women's Centre in Nottingham. Mm. My experience was very similar to Tina's. The, the additional bit, which actually perhaps had more influence on me, was literature. So Marge Piercy uh, was a very big influence on me in, in the early 70s from her sort of feminist perspective. Mm. Were any of you active contributors? Tina, you were saying you were looking to send in material about your actions mm. and campaigns. Anyone send in letters or anything else? That was kind of getting re reports yeah. in and information yeah. in and reports of a conference, of an event, yeah. or saying, you know, come to this. So it was like sometimes, you know, quite a lot of words, yeah. but it was more, it was very instrumental, functional, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and the stuff that we wrote that was like, um, was like you know feature length that was for conferences so if there was going to be a conference on sexism and education or equal pay or something on abortion it would be a paper or an article for a conference not in a magazine because it was campaign based mm. yeah really well i was um, in the 80s i took part in a round table discussion for marxism today around um women's equality officers and equal opportunities uh, policies within local authorities and that's sort of my main contribution. Interesting, very interesting. It's interesting to see how things shift as women start to move into certain kinds of roles, jobs. We were talking to a, a local activist who uh, was in working for the local council basically and her feminist ideas and values informed the way she did that job yeah you know and and she talked about the changes the significant changes that they made um to the kind of culture of the local council so it's really interesting um in terms of can you remember how you felt when you were reading these magazines you know were there any particular feelings that came through the magazines or do you remember a kind of experiencing um I don't know, you know, any, any strong feelings coming from your engagement with these periodicals? Well, actually, Cosmo, I mean, I, I can still remember how exciting it was to read about sex. <laughs> and from a woman's perspective, <laughs> it was the first time it was ever, I ever saw it in print, yeah. Well, that's interesting, it's mm. cosmopolitan. Yeah, well, it, it was. Because one of the things we're also thinking about are those periodical networks, so how the periodicals talk to each other mm. and it's not really that just the feminist periodicals were just talking about feminist issues mm. because it did spread mm. into mainstream magazines. And doesn't UK Cosmopolitan launch in the same month as Star Wave? Mm. I don't, well, I don't know. think so, mm. yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah. really inter it's interesting that you remember Cosmo. Mm. I think it's about as well as the magazine particularly, you know, it, it means that you're not isolated, that there's somebody out there that shares your ideas. And I think that's true of the sort of the, the feminist sort of magazines, journals, as it is of some of these sort of offshoots, such as, because I, I was a midwife, the Association of Radical Midwives set up, and, and they produced a, a magazine. And that was very important, really, because you realise that suddenly what you were thinking, your professional practice, others across the UK were also thinking, and I think that's the, the beauty, isn't it, of the fact that a magazine leaves you less isolated. It confirms that there's other people out there thinking the same way as you are, and it is changing professional practice as well at the same time. So quite influential. So, so how how specifically did that work? You were obviously all, all working in, in jobs and reading the magazines, and you know, were there particular ways in which you felt the stuff you were reading about was changing the way that you were operating professionally or again it was more like specific like for example um, there was an article by Glenis Lobbin 
on sexual stereotyping and reading schemes. And I don't know where I read that, mm -hmm. but it was probably in a, you know, I don't know, it wasn't in a spare rib, I don't mm -hmm. think. But things like that informed your practice because you then started mm -hmm. looking at your reading schemes yeah. and make, you know, we put an exhibition at the teacher's centre and mm -hmm. spoke at NUT conferences about that sort of thing. But I can't unpick, you know, the specific things. It was so small, but it was in the atmosphere. And I, I think yeah. that's right. I don't think there was the, every. Our lives were so busy. There wasn't a distinction between the campaigning, your work, and your home life. Everything was all about the same, mm -hmm. same thing. Or down really, the pub, or, or down the pub, and it was all, yeah, it was you know. all to do with yeah. making change in some way. And so, yeah, you did it definitely influenced my teaching practice. And and in those days. You just did, I just did whatever I wanted in the classroom. Nobody mm -hmm. knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So it's very different now. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was really lucky because I was I worked for a local authority in a women's equality unit, so I was able to be paid for campaigning. So, you know, it's just that was your whole life. Yes, these networks of yeah. all the feeding, mm -hmm. the activism, yes. and yeah. I guess the magazines were just part of all of these very much so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. giving you information. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. And all the conference papers, yeah. huge mm. numbers of conference papers. And newsletters. Yeah, and newsletters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of self-produced <laughs> stuff, which I guess, you know, is so duplicating. And, mm. and I mean, we've got a whole, we had a whole set of things here about issues in Nottingham, not actually necessarily feminist things, but, mm. you know, with a, somebody would draw the cover and then they were typed and duplicated and distributed. And that sort of self-produced stuff was, you know, quite, well, I don't know if it was significant, but it was a big part of, of stuff was, was yeah. self-produced. And so the printed things that, you know, came out every month would be interesting, but they weren't what we were doing. Yeah, because we then had to hand those out at all sorts of events. Yeah. But you were making things then? Yes. You were, were yeah. producing yeah, yeah, them yeah. and producing and distributing. Mm. Yeah. And I heard that referred to what you said about a sense of feeling less isolated. Mm. And the magazines sort of gave you that mm. that sense as somebody perhaps who, well, as you said, you've grown up in a rural area. Mm. And that, was, that, was that sort of, um, uh, did it feel like a, an emotional connection almost to the magazine in that sense? Yes, I suppose it did really, in the sense that it, it, it you know, sort of when you are isolated and you start to have no ideas and you think there's something out there, you know, and you're living in a very sort of small sort of uh, uh, world, it, it's very important, isn't it, that you could you be shown something. Uh, and it, it was very specifically about women, and it's, you know, sort of about sort of what's going on. You realise there's something to aspire to, isn't there, uh, at, at that point in time yeah. in your life, yeah. Which is important, isn't it? I think another thing about the, the sorts of magazines, some of which we've been looking for, which somebody mentioned over there earlier, is that you were looking for the fun and mm. the graphics and the innovative sort of way of pr presenting, mm. which you weren't getting in the normal everyday sort of newspapers and magazines. And that was the attraction, I think. You know, the various cartoonists who came out and wanted to try and follow. You know. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that uh, one of the the mainstream constructions of the women's movement is always about humorlessness. Yes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we've shown people the magazines, mm -hmm. they've got a particular magazine and said, oh, it's not, not very funny, is it? Mm -hmm. And but actually they're full of um, mm -hmm. cartoons mm -hmm. and, and just the way they're written, some of them. Mm -hmm. Just really fun, laugh out loud, mm -hmm. yeah. funny. And that's so. So the magazines are useful because they help to tell us a slightly different story or to correct that. that and and cartoon. I mean, who was that? Um, Leeds Postcard. Cast Jake. Jackie Fleming. Jackie as well. Fleming. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah.